I've been working at Telefonica for eight years, so I'm in a, in a tech company for quite a while. I've been investing in early stage tech startups for the last one and a half years. And sorry for saying that here, I don't care about tech so much. I care about people. And what really excites me is positive change that technology can bring for people. Sorry. There you go. This is the view from my room in Jakarta, Indonesia. I lived there in 1999, a long time ago, to do an internship at the United Nations. On my way to work, on the bus, I got to know these uh, girls you see here in the picture. Um, the youngest one, um, right above, is five years old, and the other ones were between 10, 11, 12. They were working in the buses, singing and begging for money. And I started chatting with them. And I realized back then how privileged I was uh, to be there, to work at the United Nations, and never having seen such poverty here in Munich, where I'm originally from. These girls had three problems. The first problem was they were always hungry. They were always starving. The second problem was their parents couldn't afford to send them to school. That's why they would work in the buses. And the third problem was nobody cared. Street children were a phenomenon you would see everywhere, on the streets. And also for their parents, of course, they were sad about it, but at the same time, it was normal. Nineteen years later, global hunger is still prevalent. Fact is that today, 795 million people are starving. And even if we have made great progress in lowering rates of hunger globally, our problem is that there will be many, many more people living on this planet in 2050. 9.7 billion people. Which roughly means that we will have to have 50% more food so that all of these people can eat. So how can technology help to tackle this? Satellites collecting data, drones collecting data, and sensors collecting data from the soil will help us. They will help the farmers because they can combine information from the soil with weather data to tell farmers where to put the water, which will be scarce as well. They can tell where to put the fertilizer to bring yields up. And they can give them information to allow for much less pesticides being need, down to 5%, by the way, which is awesome news. Visual is one of the companies that we're invested in in Spain. And what Visual does is providing or visualizing the data sets that you've just seen to the farmers. So they can do their own, create their own maps for the soil that they're working on and decide how to manage them. But let's not be fooled. All these high-tech solutions that I've just shown to you, they're expensive and we're far, far away from scaling this to all over the planet. They will be a part of the solution for sure, but for the time being, and if we want to fight global hunger, we need different solutions. WeFarm is a, a startup from Wira UK, and the idea is very simple and it's low tech. Fact is, it's, it's text-based, so SMS. Um, so the idea is that there's a global community of farmers, and if they have a question around um, maybe something being wrong with their coffee beans, they can put it to other farmers. Now, why is this important? 70% of all global food that is being produced on this planet comes from very small and isolated farms. They're like two hectares, and they're far away from, from other areas. So 
until now, farmers had to rely on other people being nearby, helping them with problems they were facing. With We Farm, they send a text message and they get answers from all over the world. This has been launched a couple of years ago. Um, as you can see, 180, over 180k of farmers have joined the network and 22 million messages have been shared. So this is something that fascinates me that it's, you don't even need a, a, a fancy smartphone to do any of this. You just need to send an SMS, a text message to a local number and you will get the answers straight away in, in real time. If you go to the website, you can see all of this happening um, all the time. As I told you, when I met these three girls, the five girls in Jakarta, they couldn't go to school as their parents couldn't afford it. The sad truth is that kids like the ones I got to know back then, uh, the numbers are rising. So since 2011, there are more children who are not in school anymore than before. So we're not making progress, we're going back. Fact is, also many, many adults never had elementary school. I'm talking about literacy and math, very basic things, nothing fancy. So fact is 124 million people have not attended school or have not received an education, which means 124 million lives will not have the future they, they should have had from what I think. And even more so looking at the stats, it's kind of depressing, but um, if we keep on doing what we're doing right now in terms of investing in education and putting to me these new ends of education, we will not have made any kind of progress in 2030. We will just, we're stuck. And again, what kind of solutions can technology offer to help to tackle these problems as they are important? Luca is a Telefonica daughter company focusing on data. And Luca has recently partnered with UNICEF. What it does is basically to provide the mobile phone data that Telefonica has in many countries, also Latin America, and combine it with public data or data from UNICEF itself. And this helps by great means to predict literacy rates. Now, why, you might think, how could this uh, help to find out where people can read or not read? It's a mix of uh, location-based data. So obviously, if you live in a slum and urban planners know where the slums are, location is the factor number one that helps to know where these people are, where the funding should go. Um, the second element is number of text messages going in and out, which obviously is a strong predictor of whether people can write. And last but not least, something that surprised me uh, as well is the number of social contacts that people have. So the lower the number of contacts, the more likely you are that you cannot read or write. So putting these data sets together helps UNICEF to put the funding where it should go, which will help to get more people to a proper education. A second example I came across that fascinated me is a startup, an African startup called Brick. They've just recently raised uh, four million in funding what Brick does is uh, to provide both the hardware you can see here, laptops, uh, connectivity um, and content. And this is important as many, many children are in rural areas where you don't have qualified teachers. So one of these solutions is to provide them with these hardware sets and the content to learn at a certain level. Paper, Paper Airplanes is a US initiative. It was actually uh, set up by a student someone who could be very well, someone like you, um, a student that went to a volunteer in a refugee camp teaching Syrian refugees how to learn English. And once she left, she realized she, wouldn't, she didn't want to leave the people behind. So she started doing Skype sessions. And what I really like is that at the beginning, she started with 10 friends. 10 friends said, okay, I can do that as well. I can teach English to someone over Skype, why not? For the people back in Syria, it meant the world to them to be able to learn English uh, that way. Um, this was set up also a couple of years ago. ago. They're now scaled to a thousand people volunteering for this. And another feature they just introduced is uh, coding for women. So it's not only about learning languages and teaching people English, 
but they also realize that many women are often stuck or based at their homes and teaching them to, to code in JavaScript and Python is a great way to upskill these people to be able to make a living and then in turn to be able to send their children to school. The last thing I realized uh, when I left Jakarta myself back in 99 was I had to leave the kids behind and nobody cared. So what did I do? I wrote uh, letters, handwritten, back then, to people where I thought they might care about this problem and help with money to send the kids to school. I succeeded in terms of convincing enough people to spend that money, which was not so much, uh, to send all of the girls you have seen in the picture to at least complete elementary school. But thinking about these areas these days, now I was thinking, I was able to help six children. If you think about how much you can do these days, as technology helps you so much in leveraging and giving a voice to people, it would be a very different story. You might have seen um, Bana or heard about her story. What I find fascinating is that she's a 70-year-old girl. She started tweeting in September 2016, not long ago, talking about things she would see day to day in Aleppo, uh, the horrors of the war. She was actively telling the world that she thinks it's unfair that nobody cares that she's a seven-year-old who would just like to read and write and play while Aleppo was being bombed. What you saw is that at the very beginning, of course, she had very few followers. But then it picked up and more and more people were following her and retweeting. She made the news, but she overall also managed to raise awareness on what was happening in Syria, which was not covered by the media before. This is a screenshot from Sunday. Um, again, if you look at it and you realize this is a seven-year-old with 370,000 followers, I think it's, it's amazing what technology can do. There has been some discussion whether she is real or not, or whether the tweets were truly written by her or not. But let me tell you, I don't care at all. I don't care if, if it was her or someone else. What I find fascinating is that technology can help us to expose these issues at a much faster rate than back when I was handwriting to people and say, there are a few kids back in Jakarta who need your money, please help. So, looking at all of this, you might think, what can I do about it? So I want to leave you with three thoughts that every one of us, including myself, can do right now, today. The first one is uh, an app I recently came across when working with my friends from the World Food Programme. It's an app that you can download, and for 40 cents a day, you can share a meal. 40 cents a day are enough to feed one child for a full day. It's nothing. I mean, for us, it's, it's an illegitable account of money. And again, what I really love is they've launched a couple of years ago, and they've managed to share 13 million meals with kids that really need it. So do me a favor. This is called Inspire and Dine. Download this app, contribute your little, your little part, and others will greatly profit. The second thought I have is all of us are super active on social media all the time. Start sh sharing on stuff that is relevant, not only to your friends, but maybe giving a voice to someone, uh, like the Syrian girl I showed you earlier on, so that more people hear about it. And last but not least, this is the home of the entrepreneurs. So start a startup. Uh, these are a few I, I found when, when researching what has been happening at CDTM so far. Forgive me for any startups I haven't put on this slide. But I think great ideas are already happening here. And I encourage you to do a lot more to help solve global challenges. Thanks for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your thoughts.
Yes. Um, is Vera then also um, providing uh, impact investing? Good question. Um, we have uh, in Waira UK, we have Waira Unlimited, which is doing impact investing, like the one you've seen with WeFarm. So this was a classical impact investment. Um, in Germany, we don't do impact investing as such, but as we have a focus these days on IoT startups and data startups, my hope is that we can also invest in stuff like the one you just seen that will help, even if it's a commercial use case first, let's say, with a recycled uh, use case for governments or um, non-profit partners. So it's not our angle. We're for-profit. We do early stage tech startups. We mostly do B2B software. Uh, but nevertheless, um, as I said, with the folks we have, I see that this, these worlds are also merging. Um, the only thing that will not merge, I guess, is the amount of return on investment that investors expect. So as you have said, the classical VC, of course, wants to see a 50% gain over six, eight years period. This is very different for impact investing. At Wira, um, our focus is less on the financial return in any case, but on the innovation that we can deliver to Telefonica. So we look for stuff that is relevant for the mother company and less so as we're early stage seed investor on big exits. I mean, of course we would love them, but it's not our focus. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to come back to the first subject that you've mentioned, the mm -hmm. food issue. Mm -hmm. So I see how increasing the production of food is a valuable approach to reducing the people that are hungry in the world. But if one third of food that is produced currently is getting wasted, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be a more simple approach to just conserve the food that we have now? Yes. And you're totally right. I mean, just to, due to uh, amount of time um, I could speak here, I didn't cover uh, f uh, food waste, but it's a big issue, obviously, also in terms of what levers do we have in order to feed enough people. And just on that also, I came across a, a startup that has invented a certain texture that is coming all from organic materials that will help to preserve um, the, um, the food for up to 21 days longer. So apples, for example, that would expire after, let's say, seven days, if they're coated with this um, material, um, it lasts up to three weeks. So again, I think these are examples of startups that you can see on CB Insights as game changers that also play into this whole issue of how can we tackle to feed people. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, Waira is present in uh, 11 countries in total. The majority uh, of, of us is actually in Latin America. We don't have an Asian presence as Telefonica, as a Spanish company, never ventured into, into Asia. Um, so, many of my colleagues in, in Peru, in Colombia, in Mexico, they are Venezuela, they're much closer to these types of issues, and thus they have also more startups applying with ideas like this that they then invest in. What we see here in Munich is of course very different, although we have startup applications for all over the world, but nevertheless you can truly see that here it's, yeah, it's founding teams that want to write software and, and make a lot of money, which is fair enough, um, but uh, the, the topics are different here, let's put it that way. Yes. Fantastic. My pleasure. If uh, I looked at all the I looked at all the different uh, solutions, and if you ever would like some advice on pitching your product or finding the right mentor, whatever it is, I sit here in Munich. Uh, please uh, speak to me. I'm more than happy to do that. Good. Thank you very much.